for practice of your own because you have thought about all the pros. It would be great to work for yourself, not to take orders from a large hospital administration. Perhaps you want to spend more time with your patients. Perhaps you would like to set your own schedule. Maybe you're hoping there is going to be a better quality of life, maybe. So we have some important things we think you might need to consider before you jump right in. Number one, I thought we would talk about location. So we happen to be in a small town and there are a lot of pros and cons to working and living in a small town. And choosing a location is you have to look at the demographics of where you want to work. And sometimes it's easier said than done. So you have to do some homework, basically, uh, whether there's a, a, a large elderly population, you know, which would imply Medicare also unemployment and so forth, which would imply uh, state aid like Medicaid. Why? Wow, you talk about urban, suburban, country. Again, the demographics, because you could have country and then have a demographic because if it's industrialized, if there's employment, for example, you could have a, a small town, but it has a large employer, for example. Take Greenville, South Carolina. It has a BMW plant. It also has a, a large alcohol center for Google and so forth. So they're going to have a different demographic than, say, Columbia, South Carolina, which is uh, uh, doesn't have that many right. uh, that, or even or even even a small town. So it, you can't just simply say country and stuff. That's why when you look at it, it's really it's more critical to break things down actually by demographic of of population size, income, employment. Those are going to be actually more key factors because that goes into your insurance and payer base. Right, and we will go and elaborate on that shortly. So another thing I'd want you to consider before you start a medical practice is who is your competition. You know, you need to know what other physicians doing what you're about to embark on are already out there. Um, is the market already saturated or are you going to a small town where there's only one or two of you? So those are things you might want to think about because it will impact what kind of practice or how possible it is to do what you really want to do. Um, another uh, important factor is, and again that might depend on what kind of community you're living in or going to move to, um, how accessible is the hospital? Do you have a large hospital? Is it a community hospital? Is there a large triage center? Uh, will you have limited access to these hospitals? Um, this will all impact what kind of practice you're going to have. Um, another thing I think uh, to think about when you're thinking about the hospital setting and what's available is who is going to take call for you? Um, are you planning to take call yourself? So just because you work for yourself, um, are you going to be responsible for your patients 24-7? As we all know, emergencies happen uh, any time of the day. And what are you going to do when you're sick or what do you want to do when you're uh, planning vacation? Who's taking your call for you? So these are all things you might need to consider. Yes based upon what people's incomes are, will also tell you in a sense what your payer mix is going to be. That's the part of the cost of living. Or really the other way is cost of goods and services. Okay, And that's also, it looks at also the real estate. Because whether you're going to be looking at affording either renting or leasing a, a property or space versus buying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but the majority of the time if you're in a more urban or city market, that is very tough because the cost of properties is very high. So you end up going to be leasing. So you got to look at your cost per square footage, which is going to impact also on your overhead. So it's not just cost of living, but it's cost of sales of goods and services and so forth. So those are other things that you have to look at in your overall Could you elaborate process. more about, say, what a lot of people coming out of school or training that we don't exactly have enough training about is type of insurance or insurance mix. 
um, you know, Blue Shield versus Medicare, Medicaid, right. and how right. that impacts your business. Well, that's what's called payer mix. Because again, the one thing that's frustrating about the medical business versus any other, and it is a business, you know, and that's what they don't it teach you. If you go into solo practice or even to a group practice, okay, you're going to go in and, and you're going to take your expertise and you're, you're going to want to take care of people. But fortunately, some guy who either has an MBA or even doesn't even have an MBA, but it's in a suit and tie, it's going to make a determination of what your value is based upon productivity and so forth. And one of the things that's going to happen is, is that it's going to be based upon payer mix. That is the insurance contractors, whether it be Medicare, Medicaid, private insurers, or even private or Medicare fee-for-service insurers, all their pay structures are going to be vastly different. And that's where the frustration comes in. Mm -hmm. So based upon your contractual arrangement, so if you're going to solo practice, that means that you're going to have to negotiate those contracts on your own. And for example, if you are, just get an example like Medicaid. If your primary practice is primarily Medicaid and, and that's your predominant payer mix, your payment may not be enough of a cash flow to support your overhead costs of employees. For example, when we first moved to this area, and again, we live in a very small town, uh, most of our patients were commercial payers. We had a lot of right. Blue Shield, Blue Cross, and over the last five to ten years after losing a lot of the teachers to, from the area or a lot of the educated uh, people that may have moved out of the area um, a lot of the people or patients that we have now predominantly have Medicare and Medicare Medicaid. and yeah. Medicaid right. so that pays a lot less than if we had commercial insurance which in turn diminishes our returns despite the work well, that we have to yeah, do. Yeah, and the thing is, is that you, the other thing you have to look at, the, the key to successful practice is cash flow. That, and which is true in all, almost every business, but very particularly because remember, when you're dealing with third party payer, you have basically a, a delay of, of reimbursement from the time the service is rendered to the time that you actually receive and payment. And that's incredibly frustrating. For example, you go to a restaurant, you eat you pay for your services immediately because you consume the products that they deliver to you. In medicine, you see a patient and you're not paid for mm. what? Weeks, sometimes yeah, months. Sometimes months. So to go back to what Dr. Tanao is talking about in, in regards to the restaurant. So say, give an example, you, you, you own a restaurant, someone comes in and they eat. And then after they consume the, the food and then they have the service, say they go to the cashier and say, hey, listen, fantastic meal. Um, you, you're going to charge me $25, but I'll tell you what, my cousin Roy <laughs> is going to pay for it. Right. And he'll come around and pay for it. My cousin and, Roy is the insurance company. The, the third party, third party payer. My cousin Roy will come in 30 days and he's going to go ahead and pay that bill for you, okay? Now, on top of that, Cousin Roy comes down in 30 days and says, hey, I'm here to pay on my cousin's bill. It's $25. You know what? That's not the deal we set up is that he's actually supposed to chip in $5. So here's 20 right now. And uh, you need to get that other $5 from my cousin. That's really in a nutshell what medicine is today. So you have to chase the patient for their copay, co-insurance while you're waiting for reimbursement. And sometimes what happens is that the insurance plays a shell game where they not clearly tells you, because especially if it's a sliding scale or percentage, you don't quite really know until after they send you an EOB uh, explanation of benefits, what that payment is. Now right. you're chasing a patient. So really your full payment can really take up to six months because you're chasing pay patients, which cost money, and then you're waiting f for the payment from the insurance company. Okay, and that's then that is if everything goes smoothly, right? Okay, but there's so many things can delay it. If, for example, under these Obamacare programs, if the patient doesn't keep up with their premiums, those insurances can re refuse you payment for up to 90 days until they collect that. 
And if not, they can refuse you outright. So you're sitting there holding, waiting for payment for 90 days, and you can still end up with nothing. Already after you already have render services and consume uh, supplies and pay for labor. Right. So there's a lot that goes into running a medical practice that's incredibly risky and scary. And uh, you would think that after 10 years, uh, we have it down to a science and we're just coasting, but it totally is not like that. It's still incredibly difficult, very challenging. Um, and I just want you to be able to take this all into account. This is not a video trying to uh, discourage you from running a medical practice. We just want you to be able to have all the questions asked and uh, make sure that you're going into it knowing fully well what some of the risks are. Um, okay, so another thing I want you to consider when uh, thinking about a medical practice, you might want to go into a cash-only business. Uh, this is something some physicians are doing. They don't want to deal with insurance companies. Uh, and in order to do that successfully, I think you have to be in the right community or again, where the cost of living supports that sort of practice. In a small town where people uh, don't have jobs, um, don't have cash, that business model would not work. So that's just something to keep in mind. In a big city, that might be a good option. Another uh, practice type that we see, uh, and people have often asked me, why don't I do concierge medicine? I love to spend a lot of time with my patients. I love to go all out um, pretty much as if I were doing concierge medicine. Again, however, that type of practice is best suited for a big city uh, where people can afford to pay uh, large sums of money to retain your services. Um, okay, so we're just going to switch subjects a little bit and move on to uh, another subject, which is be very careful who you align yourself with. So you're going into practice and maybe you're considering working with another provider. Maybe you're planning to rent from another provider or business, or you're planning to have a nurse practitioner, you're planning to have a PA. Um, you really need to do your homework because what most physicians don't realize is that you have to have the time to supervise, to guide uh, these uh, other people, and when they do something um, you know, uh, bad or harmful to, harmful to a patient, you are likely responsible um, because they are under, supposed to be under your care. Um, another thing you might wanna think about when doing your research about who you align yourself with is what hospital are you, uh, you know, having privileges with? What hospital, what is their reputation? What does the community think about their reputation? Um, be, you really have to be careful. You've spent years of schooling, you've spent years developing yourself, your reputation is everything as a physician, and so you can destroy that when you align yourself with the wrong people or wrong organizations. Um, you have anything else to say about no, that? No, I mean, but it, 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 again, it's critical, especially when you're starting a practice, it's really the key is to be lean. Mm -hmm. And so even before you go into getting a nurse practitioner or something like that, the thing is you want to be, again, it's all about overhead and cost. So sometimes when you're trying to stay lean, this kind of ties in with the alignment, is that sometimes you want to hire family members or you want right. to you want to you want to go cheap and say oh well I'll get someone that uh, that, that seems friendly and that won't work for much to do the office stuff again you get what you pay for and really you want to keep things as as professional and uh, you want to get people who are certified right. that that people are that can be licensed and bonded um, and people that you know you can trust because again there's too much going out there in regards to thievery uh, pres prescription paths being stolen funds being stolen 
stuff like that is because you're busy trying to take care of patients and treating them and stuff. Mm -hmm. Someone has to watch the till. Right. You know? Right. At the end of the day, it's your practice. And so, you know, you can't turn around and say, oh, you know, I wasn't aware that that uh, nurse's aide or nurse practitioner was not licensed to do X, Y, and Z. You hired her, she represents your practice. Right. Uh, it's always, for example, really important to me when we have a receptionist that she speaks simple English. And that may seem stupid, proper. but proper English. Right. That may seem a given, but I can't stand when someone calls on the phone and you can't understand what the person is saying on the other line, or they're clearly incredibly unprofessional. Um, that person is your front man, they represent you. So whoever you hire, it's really important to remember that you want someone that represents your brand. Right. And be careful again hiring family or yeah. friends because are you going to be able to set guidelines, guidelines, boundaries? What if that person isn't doing their job well? Are you going to be comfortable telling them what they need to do different? Are you going to be comfortable firing them or letting them go when they're not doing their job appropriately? Another reason to consider why, again, hiring friends and right. family members can, it can put you into a situation that you'll end up regretting or making you very uncomfortable. And you just don't need that headache when you're struggling with the day-to-day -day operations of a new practice. All right, so next area I want us to talk about is how to know or how, how much money do you want to make? And this is the part where I think when you come out of training, nobody really talks to you about the economics, the business part of medicine. How possible is it to make the uh, living that you would like? Uh, you really need to know your numbers. And when I came out, I honestly cannot say that I understood the business well. Um, you're going to have to take into account that you have a lot of overhead uh, that you're trying to keep down to a minimum and there's going to be some costs involved such as rent, disposable materials, medical equipment such as syringes, gloves, etc. Payroll. Software. Software, practice management, EMR, uh, now e in the 2016. E-script, e which is mandatory in, in, in many, uh, uh, actually like in New York State and so forth, it's turning into a mandatory process. Mm -hmm. um, you also have malpractice, you also have uh, property insurance, you also have, uh, you know, again, phone, fax. Right, um, health insurance. Health insurance. You have to factor all these into place when you're designing your practice. Um, who's doing your billing or your coding mm -hmm. and we really don't get taught any of this in medical school it's something you come out and you learn um, and how important is it to have uh, a good billing or coding program oh, and tremendous. the cost of doing that well it's, it's very important because without that you're not gonna get paid I mean it's mm -hmm. as simple as that if you don't have a, 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 a info way to process two things can happen is that you, you either get underpaid or overpaid, which are both bad. You get underpaid and uh, your cash flow suffers, you're not going to stay in business. You get overpaid, you get the money, but guess what? The government can turn around five, six, right. eight years later, they do an audit and they say, hey, you're, you're going to get that money back and they're going to go after you. That's exactly, I'll give you an example, North Carolina, the Medicaid system went through an audit and they went back and there was a practice, a multi-physician practice uh, out in Charlotte, I believe, and they assessed them fifty thousand dollars. Wow! Penalty uh, for overpayment, and they demanded that money back. Wow! And they're going to demand it back immediately. They're not going to say, "Well, let's work it out over five years, ten years." They're saying, "Hey, we paid you fifty thousand. You owe us fifty thousand." So you really need to know what you're doing when you're doing it. Uh, we've been fortunate to work together. Fortunate, or Kent might think unfortunate. But I've been very fortunate to have my husband, uh, someone that I trust above anyone else, to do my coding and billing for me, which means that we've never been fined. Um, no. 
We've never gotten in trouble for over billing or, you know, we just never have gotten in trouble in that respect. But if I had to pay somebody else to do it, it would have been very, very expensive. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have been able to afford this. So you want to keep in mind who is doing your billing and coding because in essence, you don't want to work for free. None of us need to work for free. And unfortunately, this is a service you're going to need and it costs a lot of money. Yeah, because also with Bill and Cody, it's also working and doing the contracts, ensuring that we're also in network, uh, verifying insurances, and then also appealing because many times insurances will deny uh, payment even though it's valid and then you have to appeal it, rebill and repay and stuff and, and so forth. So I mean, and that in itself takes a quite a bit of time as well. So um, that's where the key is to be lean. And, and this is again, if you want to be a successful solo practice, again, depending upon where you're going to do your practice and who you're going to do it with, uh, that, that person is going to be your right hand person. It's going to be the practice administrator. And you want someone that's going to be strong, that's, that's uh, up on HIPAA, on compliance, on credentialing. Now what if I'm starting off so lean and I decide that I'm going to do this alone? It's just me and a receptionist. Do you think it's possible to run a practice just as a physician would say a receptionist and no, no billing or coding person? Uh, I mean you could, you can. Um, it would be extremely hard but you can. Um, you would just you just have to have a, a program. There are some uh, practice management programs or EHR programs out there. You know, if you're going to also do labs, right. which would mean then you would also draw blood as well as the physician, mm -hmm. um, and then and then the receptionist and so forth. That means then you're going to have to input the coding into the lab system mm -hmm. as well. So you're going to be doing a lot of work for one patient, uh, which is fine which means you just can't see that many patients but then you right. wouldn't need to if you're operating out for example this one doctor just rented a room basically um one exam room he was going very very lean um out of another practice and that's what he did and he had a practice management system where he easily just punched in the uh, codes or diagnosis and they would do the billing for him and that was that but see, that's just that's just the front side of the operations. There's right. so much that goes on There's behind. So much that goes on behind. That um, that's why I would think that really technically, in all honesty, that's more an exception than the rule because. At least nowadays, with all the regulations in place. There's so much unfunded mandates, and the thing is, is that what also the other thing that is just never is discussed is collections, mm -hmm. because when patients don't pay, who's going to do the collections? Mm -hmm. If you then give it to a collection you see you know there's that's a fee and for it costs service. you to to go to the collection agency right so that and you don't that, get your money right. immediately so that and means, you may not get your money right, ever right and that means you got to collect up front which means then are you going to be the type of person that has to say no if you don't have your your money up front you got to turn them away mm -hmm. or you're the kind of person that's going to say hey you know what We'll work something out, which we've have done for many we've years. We've done for years. Many years. We've done for years. And it's um, very, very difficult. And it's very, very difficult. Very difficult. Very difficult. Because the thing too is people remember like like Medicare, see that's the other thing. Medicare has an annual deductible. Okay? And then so for example, for twenty sixteen the annual deductible is hundred and sixty six dollars. Well, there's many patients that all they have is Medicare. They don't have a secondary because secondary insurance costs AARP, mutual of Omaha. Those insurance costs sometimes up to five, six hundred dollars a month. So they're paying money for that. So some people just have Medicare alone. What if they don't have deductible, but they come to you and they're sick? You turn them away, they go to the emergency room. Uh, all these different areas that we've touched upon, because in the end, what you're trying to do is calculate how many patients you need to see to cover your cost and your overhead right. and still have enough money to pay yourself yeah. and of course meet payroll. Right. So the average practice uh, with today's uh, reimbursement rates and stuff like that, that usually it's approximately about 20 to 30 patients a day. 
Wow. That's what I thought because that you got to include also loss. Right. Patients not paying, um, and and the, um, the cost of front staff, back staff, uh, malpractice, all those things, and so so there's only so many things that you can adjust. Right. In order to to get go lean, and that's where you're looking at payroll. Payroll is is one of the biggest costs in any business, restaurant, doesn't matter what industry, payroll is your biggest cost. So you got to look at payroll. And then there are other things that you, uh, then you got to look at your fixed overhead costs. That's where, again, you know, where you're renting, leasing, also your malpractice. Usually when you're starting off, your malpractice is going to be very high. Okay, because again, you're in your new doctor, the, the risk level is high. So most of the malpractice insurance is, is going to be high. And then they'll start tapering over time. All the things we've talked about, you know, thinking about access to hospital, cost of living, your income uh, of your patients or the demographics, all of this I think would be relevant regardless of whether you're going into primary care or your specialist. Uh, I think all the issues we touched upon are relevant if you're thinking, are relevant if you're thinking about being self-employed physician uh, versus an employed physician. So I hope you found this video uh, helpful and we will be more than happy to answer any questions or um, issues that we may not have touched upon. This is a huge yeah. subject. Yeah. Um, we can't possibly do it all in one right. video, right. but we hope you'll check, uh, check out our second or part two uh, where we discuss how to stay out of trouble and avoid disciplinary actions. Mm -hmm. Um, we also will put out a video about uh, or giving you a tour of our clinic. Um, so thank you again. Yeah, and if you and again, if there's a specific uh, topic that you'd like us to talk about more in depth, like EHR um, practice management programs, stuff like that, comparing them, you know, so we'd be more than happy to do those things or anything else like that. That again, because we just kind of glossed over, or even just a step by step of of setting up a practice, um, we can also go into that as well. Uh, again, depending upon your interest. Thank you very much. All right, this video is going to be about things you didn't, oh, I mean, how I constantly remember, staring right into the center. Not at me, staring right in the center. Um, things you didn't learn in medical school. I wish I didn't all of these things, well, because your ass didn't go to med school. Yeah, that would explain that. <laughs>